Welcome to this screencast which covers our third and final type of factoring. We've already factored out greatest common factors. That reverses the type of multiplication where we take one term and distribute it to many terms. After that we learned how to factor a difference of two squares. A type of factoring that reverses uh, the multiplication of a binomial times a binomial when the middle terms cancel out. And finally we will be factoring trinomials and we have the foolproof factoring method found in the book and that has its own screencast and here is an alternative method to that form of factoring. Before we actually jump right into the factoring method I'm about to show you, let's talk a little bit about multiplying because it's when we multiply, which is basically changing something from written as a product to written as a sum or difference of a bunch of terms, when we multiply it gives us a lot of insight on how to reverse that process when we go to factor something. So let's just multiply this out first. 3x times the 5x gives me 15x squared. 3x times the negative 2 gives me a negative 6x. 5 times the 5x gives me a 25x positive. And then finally, the 5 times the negative 2 gives me a negative 10. And then typically we combine our two like terms. So if we were multiplying something out, we have here this particular trinomial once we've combined the two like terms. Keep in mind, going from here to here is called multiplying, or sometimes you refer to it as foiling. What we're doing when we factor is we're taking something given to us in this form and we're reversing back to the form that we had before somebody multiplied. The method of factoring that I'm about to show you is often referred to as the trial and error method. And it's used when you have a three-termed uh, polynomial that you're trying to reverse back to the product form. Before I show you this technique, it's worthwhile to examine a little bit more closely the multiplication process because understanding that really well helps you reverse that when you go to factoring. So notice when we went and multiplied we ended up with a 15x squared term and I should just remind you where did that 15x squared come from? It came from the product of the two x terms, those that you often refer to as firsts. And then if you see the number term, the number term came from the product of the two lasts. This middle term is the big mystery. The 19x came from adding together two separate terms. And these two separate terms came from the multiplication of the outers or the two terms that are most distant from each other and from the product of the inners. So basically when you spelled out the word FOIL the outers and the inners were those two multiplication process that we just did that I showed with the brackets. So the hard term is the middle term and it comes from combining the two terms that you get from multiplying the outer terms together and the inner terms together. Now let's apply this to a new problem. So here's our first example, and I would always check to see if there's a greatest common factor first, and there is none. And it's not a difference of two squares, because first of all, there's three terms, not two terms. So we're going to try our trinomial trial and error method. And looking at this, this is a more basic one, so this one's a good one to start on. You remember that these come from multiplying two binomials. So let's go ahead and draw some generously sized parentheses. 
And I don't know if you remember, but this first term came from the product of the two first. So I have to put things in the first locations of each parentheses that multiply to give me x squared. Well, there aren't many choices. The only choices are x and x. If this had been like a 6x squared, it might have been a 2x and a 3x, or maybe a 6x and a 1x. So it depends on what numbers are in front of it, but when there's just a 1 as a coefficient of the x squared, then basically the only possible number factors that give you a 1 for a coefficient are 1 and 1. This last term here, remember, comes from the product of the two last. So I'm only going to put in these positions numbers that give me 12. One thing I do a little differently sometimes than, than others is I don't really do any analysis about the signs. There is some, There are some rules that you may have been exposed to, uh, but I'm going to actually hold off on those for now. Because so often I see people put the right numbers in but with the wrong signs and they end up discarding the right numbers. Remember this is trial and error so basically we know those two things we put in these last slots have to multiply to 12. Well that kind of limits us to 1 times 12, 2 times 6, 3 times 4. The next one that goes in evenly is 4 times 3, and you can see that we've already got that pair of numbers listed on this. So once you start getting repetitions, you're done. I've made a list of all the possible factors of 12, and I'm going to go with, usually I'll try the closer together numbers, 3 and 4 are closer to each other, uh, ahead of the 1 and the 12. So let's try the 3 and the 4. And another thing that I tend to do is I tend to multiply. I already know the x times the x will give me the x squared. I already know the 3 times the 4 will give me a 12. Why? Because I made my very short list of possible factors that could give me the 1 for the 1x squared and the 12 from the last term. So since I'm restricting myself to these and I know the first and last term will work out, it's really that middle term I've got to check. Remember, the middle term comes from the product of the outers, so that's a 4 times an x. Multiply, added to the product of the inners, so that's a 3 times x. So I just do the product of the outers, and I actually don't worry about the sign at this stage, so I write the 4x and I write the 3x. And I say, if I had my way about the signs, could I ever add a 4x and a 3x and get a positive 7x out of it? I decide the signs at this stage, they'd have to both be positive to result in a middle term of 7x. So I go put the plus signs in here. And then the last thing I check is I just make sure that the multiplication of the two lasts give me the proper signs. So here's a, this is positive, and this is positive, which should yield a positive 12, and that agrees with what I started with. Keep in mind, this x squared plus 7x plus 12 was the unfactored form. And once we're done, we have the thing written as a product. Let's try another problem. So now we'll try our second example. You can see it looks a little bit more complex than the first one, but so long as we're systematic about things, it should still fall into place. So notice first, I've already ruled out that there's a greatest common factor, and it's obviously not a difference of two squares because it's got three terms. So I'm assuming this is one that I will do using the trinomial trial and error process. So to begin, I would go ahead and draw my two sets of parentheses, make them generously sized so you don't run out of space. Now I'm going to make a list of all the factors that would give me the 3. I already know there's an x and an x, but I need to find numbers that multiply to the right coefficient. Well, just 1 times 3 is our only possibility, because 3 doesn't have many pairs of factors. So when there's only one set, and I know right away in my head what it is, I usually just go ahead and write it in and not even make a list. 
35 has a few more possibilities. Remember what goes in the last positions always has to multiply to give me the third term. So I'll go ahead and make a list of all the factors of 35. 1 goes in evenly all the time, so 1 times 35. 2 doesn't go evenly in there. 3 doesn't go evenly. 4 doesn't go evenly. 5 does, though. 5 times 7. 6 doesn't go evenly in there. And 7, well, 7 times 5 does, but I've already got that pair of factors. So there's my complete list. If you know your, fa your multiplication tables really well, then it certainly helps that list form much more quickly. Otherwise, you could use your calculator to see if certain things go in. Alright, so I have to pick a pair of these, and there's no guarantee where I should put them. Although, after you've done a lot of these, you get pretty good at seeing where they should go. But for now, I'm just going to try the 7 and the 5 like that. And I already know that the 3x squared term will work out, because I only put things on this list here that would give me those first two terms. And likewise, I know that these are the only possibilities for the last term, so I know the last term will, will work out. So really, it's that middle term I've got to check and see if that's going to work out. Remember, the middle term comes from the product of the outers added to the product of the inners. So let's go get the product of the outers. I see 15x. The product of the inners is 7x. And if I have my way about signs, could I ever get a 16x from a 15x and a 7x? And the answer is no. So now I'll try reversing the order and I'll put the 5 here and the 7 here and see if that makes a difference because since the 3x and the 1x don't look alike and the outers get multiplied together and the inners uh, it might make a difference to my products. So the 3x times a 7 gives me a 21x, and the 5 times the 1x gives me a 5x, and I ask myself, if I have my way with the signs, can I ever get a 16x positive from this 21x and 5x? And the answer is yes. If I were combining these two, and if my 21x was positive, and my 5x was negative, it would come out to be a positive 16x. So what I do is I go up to my factoring and I go find the thing that was involved in the 21x and that was the 7. So I make that positive and then that means the other one is negative. The last thing I always check is I always check the sign of the last term. This negative 5 and this positive 7 better multiply together to be a negative 35 and it, indeed it does. If it was a positive 35 there, then my trial and error process would have just been a close miss, and I'd have to try yet some more pairings. So the final answer is this thing right here. This is the factored form of the thing that I started with. I think we should try another problem. This final problem is actually the most difficult by far of the three. Feel free to pause this video at any point to try to stay ahead of me even by a step uh, or certainly pause when I do a step and then you try it on your own too. So this one is much more difficult because if you notice 20 has a lot more factor choices than just 1 and 20 and 12 has quite a few factor choices as well. So I already see there is no common factor. There's nothing that goes into 20, 31, and 12 evenly. And there's no x common to every term. And it's not a difference of two squares. So we're going to use this trinomial trial and error method. And again, remember, the first term comes from the product of the first. So I'm going to go ahead and write all my factors of 20 that I can think of. 1 goes in evenly. 2 goes in 10 times. 3 doesn't go evenly in, but 4 goes in five times and then five goes in but I'm starting to get my repetitive pairs so that's all of them and then the 12 is a 1 times 12 2 goes in evenly six times and 3 goes in evenly four times and 4 goes evenly in three times but now I'm starting to get my repetitive pairs so I stop there 
but that's still quite a few combinations. So again, remember my little hint about trying the closer together numbers before you try the far apart numbers. Let's try the 4x and the 5x in there. And likewise, let's try the 3 and the 4. So I'm going to go ahead and put the 3 here and the 4 here. And I see from the product of the outers, the 4x times the 4 gives me a 16x. And the 3 times a 5x gives me a 15x. And I ask myself, if I have my way with the signs, can I ever get a positive 31x from these two terms being combined? And as you can see, they both, if they're positive, would add up to 31x. So I think we stumbled on our correct pairing on the first try. So I'm going to go ahead and put the plus sign here so that the 15x will come out to be positive. By making the 4 positive, that makes sure that the 16x is positive. And there's my factorization. Let me, we kind of stumbled on the pairing very quickly because you were using my ideas of trying the closer together numbers first. I think I'll explain still what I would have done if I tried the 4 and the 5 over here, I would try it with the 3 and the 4, and if that didn't work, I'd try it with the 4 and the 3. And if that didn't work, I'd go and try the next closest together pair, 2 and 6, and then I would try it with 6 and 2 if it didn't work with the 2 and the 6. And then I would try it with 1 and 12, and I would try it with 12 and 1. And if the pairing of 4 and 5 struck out with all three pairs and their reversals, I would then switch my 4x and my 5x to the 2 times 10 instead, so it would be a 2x and a 10x. And then I'd try it with a 3 and the 4, and the 4 and the 3. I'd try it with a 2 and the 6, I'd try it with a 6 and the 2. I try it with the 1 and the 12, and the 12 and the 1. And if 2 and 10 struck out with all of these, then I would switch to the 20x and the 1x. And I try them with each of these and their reversals. Now that sounds like a whole lot of work, but in fact, my trick of starting with the closer together numbers usually causes you to stumble on the right answers much sooner. And secondly, for those of you who know your times tables really well, certain pairs of factors might jump out at you as, oh, I know this will work. That comes with experience and with practice. Um, in the meantime, if you're read a, as a beginner with this and you're not that good with your times tables, have a calculator handy to double check when things go evenly in there so that you can develop the lists. But also, um, to check the products in case you need to use your calculator, that's fine. But the key is really to uh, practice. And you'll find that occasionally you'll have tried every combination and none of them will work. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes you get a trinomial that never came from somebody multiplying something out. So there's no reversal to be found. If that's the case, I'm sure I would give you a problem that would have far fewer factors to check than this many. Um, again, feel free to use the foolproof factoring, which is the other screencast, and uh, try that method. And I certainly don't always use that. I use it more when I have a lot of factors um, that to try. I might use that method then. But go ahead and... Uh, try one. I'm going to give you one to try right at the very end here. So go ahead and try this one on your own and bring it to class. Hope this screencast was helpful.